Thank you. Is this working? Okay, fantastic. So, thank you so much for the introduction, Troy. I'm really excited to be here. I'm gonna talk today about LinkedIn and things you can do to optimize your profile, but also how to prospect better. So, let's go ahead. My background is unique, and the reason I wanna talk about it is because when you were five, you probably didn't think you'd be in the profession you were today. Or maybe you did, but for me, I actually majored in opera. So I've traveled the world singing. I've sung on Air Force One. I've met presidents. I've sung for congressmen. But my point is, is that when I graduated college, my parents gave me all of my bills and said, go forth, sweetie. You're going to be great. And I suddenly had no job. I had all these bills to pay, loans to pay. And I found myself in a weird situation where I was supposed to go to New York and supposed to you know, have three jobs and try to make it work in opera. But it didn't end up working out. So I decided to go into sales. It took nine months, nine months to get my first interview at Bronto Software. My background before that, I was an executive assistant to a VP of real estate at FedEx. And basically I had health insurance and benefits, but has anyone seen the movie Devil Wears Prada? Awesome, so a little bit similar. So I decided, you know what, this is great. Um, it did teach me some things though, and what it taught me is that anyone with a title, it doesn't matter what your title is, we put on pants the same way. So when I went into sales, suddenly when I was prospecting people with big titles, I was not nervous about prospecting them because I'd ridden the elevator with the CEO of FedEx. It was no big deal. So going into Bronto, it took me nine months to get my interview, they finally hired me, and right off the bat, I was performing a lot better than the others. And the reason was, is because I was using LinkedIn to prospect. How many people remember when LinkedIn was for jobs only? Anyone in the room? Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of people in this world that still think it's just for jobs. I remember when I was updating my profile back in the day, I was nervous that I didn't want my boss to see that I was updating my profile because I didn't want him to think I was looking for another job. It's very different now. Now it's very much a sales tool and they even have Sales Navigator part of LinkedIn. Who uses Sales Navigator in the room? Do I have some Sales Navigator users? Okay, fantastic. So I left Bronto. I was recruited to another company where I trained their team on how to use LinkedIn effectively and how to prospect and drive pipeline and revenue. From there, I went to Etel Insights and then I decided to start my own consulting business, which I'm doing now. So I travel the country speaking at conferences as well as work with companies one-on-one -on -one in workshops as well as interactive webinars. I occasionally keynote at conferences as well, sales kickoffs, and so this is my life. I go around teaching people how to use LinkedIn effectively, but then also sales enablement. So I go into companies and see the sales tools you have today, and I enhance them and teach you how to make them better. So LinkedIn, what is social selling? So this is a word that I think people are a little bit scared of because they don't know what it is. Everyone has a different opinion of what it is. If you go on, if you go on Google today, everyone's gonna have an opinion of what social selling is. This is just my opinion of what it is. So it's connecting and building relationships with prospects through a social channel. That's all it is to me, and that's what I think has been really helpful, is social selling, using that layer with email, with calls. I'm not saying to take away emails, I'm not saying way to take away calls, but consider using social media to generate more pipeline. And the best way to do it is through LinkedIn. So profile, I wanna talk about everyone's profile. This is a first impression. If there's one thing you leave this room with today, look at your profile. Is it inviting? Is it a good first impression? You cannot undo a first impression, trust me. So you wanna make sure you have it filled out. This is really easy to tell if you have it filled out. The top right there, you're gonna see profile strength. You can see I'm at the all-star level, so that means I have pretty much everything filled out in your profile. The reason you wanna do this is again, when somebody goes to your profile, it's a first impression, but you want them to be able to see what you do and what you offer. So this is really important. Make sure you have your sections filled out. Make sure you have your previous jobs in past tense. I can't stress that enough. So many times I go to people's profile and they're still working somewhere from 2002 because it's in present tense. These are simple things you can change. You can also highlight your career. So if you've been featured in an article or you've partaken in an article, if you've written an article or you have been featured in something, you can publish it on LinkedIn. If you have a YouTube channel, 
you can highlight that on your LinkedIn profile. There are a lot of different things you can do. But do remember, it still is a public resume. So while we're talking about sales and generating pipeline and revenue, it still is a public resume. So in my world, when I'm hiring sales professionals, the first place I look when I'm about to interview them is LinkedIn. And if they don't have a LinkedIn profile or they don't have a LinkedIn profile that speaks to me, that kind of docks them and if I'm gonna pass them on or not to the next level. And the reason why is because if they're not prospecting me, if they're not researching me, if their profile isn't inviting, how on earth are they going to do a job well in sales? So I really do consider this a very, very key feature that you should consider as well. You can also highlight your accomplishments. So if you've made President's Club or you were the number one sales rep in a quarter, you can mention that on your LinkedIn profile. And then the obvious thing, make sure you have a photo. <laughs> make sure you have a photo, and not a photo of you and your spouse, not a photo of you and your dog, a photo of you, preferably you know, waist up or head up, a headshot. You do not have to spend $300 to get a professional photo done. You can do it anywhere. Just make sure you don't have a noisy background and make sure people aren't cropped out of it. So, key sections. I'm just gonna go through these pretty briefly. But the key sections I wanna point out, obviously, is your summary. So your summary is right below your photo, and so many people have the summary blank. And you wanna have the summary filled out because it helps you with SEO, search engine optimization. It helps a prospect understand what you do, what you offer, and it allows you to put a history of yourself. So for me, mine is pretty personable. I tell a story about how I started in opera and now I'm, on, now I'm in sales and I'm still on stage, it's just a different stage. So you can see my personality shine through the LinkedIn profile section, the summary section rather. The header is really important. A lot of people think the header is just your title. And I think it's a really good place to put what you offer in your header. So for instance, for myself, I have social selling experts, and then I talk about consulting in my header. So you can do things like that. You can use the word resource. You can use the word consulting. Those are really good header words. Instead of just putting VP of sales at XYZ company, consider putting other words that help. Next section, projects and experience. Again, if you've been in, featured in an article, you've written an article, highlight that. And then finally, awards. Awards is great. MVP, President's Club, whatever you wanna put in there. And then finally, recommendations. So many people have recommendations blank. And you should definitely have that filled out. And my methodology is if I'm working with a customer or I close a deal, Typically within 90 days, I ask that prospect or customer for a recommendation, and in return, I will give them one as well. So it's really easy to do, and it doesn't take a ton of time. So building a network. So a lot of people ask me, well, when do you connect with somebody? For me personally, my belief is that if you have two-way communication with somebody, you can add them on LinkedIn. What you don't wanna do is add somebody on LinkedIn and then immediately spam them. You don't wanna do that. Uh, it, help, it hurts your score, it hurts your profile, and then also, it just doesn't have a good rapport with that person. So two-way communication. I don't care if I meet you at a trade show and we talk. I don't care if I met you at a restaurant and we ended up talking. I will add you on LinkedIn. It doesn't matter if they're in my industry or not. The more people you have in your network, the, the better your chances are at getting to somebody. The best way to prospect is finding that mutual connection and trying to get them to send an introduction for you. So these are all really, really important things. It helps you nurture relationships as well. How many people have been on a really good first call with a prospect and then they go dark? Anyone had that happen? Everyone's hand should be raised, let's be honest. <clears throat> so that happens all the time. And so what better way to nurture them than first of all, adding them on LinkedIn, but then also if they're publishing content and they're sharing content, they're sharing photos, you can like that content, comment on that content, and then suddenly they will remember you and remember your name, and then hopefully they'll get back on the bandwagon to chat with you further. So I do that all the time. If somebody goes dark, I go to their profile, see what they've been up to, see where, see where they've been traveling, see where they've been um, featured in, and I will comment on that or like it. And then all of a sudden my name is showing up on their feed. SSI, Social Selling Index. Does anyone in this room know what that is or heard of it? 
Couple people. Okay. So this is a new thing that LinkedIn has launched probably about a year and a half ago, and it's their score. So every single person in this room has an SSI score. You can go to this website, linkedin.com forward slash sales forward slash SSI, and everyone has a score. Whether you're in sales or not, doesn't matter. And it's free to find out. You don't have to have the premium version. LinkedIn launched this, and it's based out of 100 points, 25 points for each section, section. And what it does is give you a score for how good you are in each section. So the first session is establishing a professional brand. So if you have your profile filled out all the way, like I was showing you in the other slide, if it's all filled out, you should get a 25 out of 25 very easily. The next ses section is finding the right people. So if you're adding people consistently on LinkedIn or people are adding you, your score should be a 25 out of 25. It's pretty consistent across the board. Engaging with insights. So I was once a 99 out of 100, and my one point was missing with engaging with insights. So I'm a little bitter about it. But what it is, is basically liking people's content, sharing content, writing publications. You can write on LinkedIn. I do that all the time, and it really helps my brand. So this score is pretty much the lowest for everybody. You can always be doing more, but I don't want to be one of those people that's just liking content to like it. The last part is building relationships. So again, adding people on LinkedIn, fostering relationships, liking their content, sending them messaging, and all of that. So that's a pretty easy part to get as well. 25 out of 25. Because of my SSI score, and because of an article I wrote last June over a glass of wine, I went viral on LinkedIn because of this article. And because of this article, they invited me to the LinkedIn conference, and they said, you have the highest SSI score ever, and we want you to go on stage with Shaquille O'Neal and shoot free throws. And uh, I've never played sports in my life. I've always been on stage. I've always been doing opera and learning German, French, and Italian. I've never played basketball. So right off the bat, this was a Sunday, and I leave on Tuesday for Vegas. I go and tell my husband, and he says, oh, crap, you're screwed. And I said, I know. I know. I've never done this. So I go upstairs. I get these heels on that I'm wearing, go outside, get a basketball. It was pretty deflated. And I start practicing my free throws. And he's trying to critique me, critique me as if he's ever played basketball. So I shoot about 20 hoops, and I get two in. So I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. And suddenly, um, I get there, and I'm more nervous about this shack thing than my own presentation. My own presentation was a really big deal, but I was more nervous about this. So I get on stage, and I don't know if anyone's had this moment where you kind of don't remember, and you're just kind of in a zone, but I got both of them in. And I can't explain it to this day, but because of that, they donated $10,000 to the Boys and Girls Club of America. So it was really, really fun. But because of my SSI score, because of an article I wrote, this happened. So what I'm telling you is I was basically, people knew who I was on LinkedIn. I had several connections, probably like 3,000. And because of this, I now have 11,000 followers because of this one event. So you never know when LinkedIn could pick up something like this for you. <clears throat> So prospecting on LinkedIn. How many people today prospect on LinkedIn? Okay, fantastic, that's great. So there are some sections I wanna talk about. So the first one is obviously identifying your prospect. If you have Sales Navigator, it's very easy to do. So I highly recommend Sales Navigator. It's easier to find prospects. The second part, the research part, is what I'm known for and why people fly me across the country to work with their sales teams. Researching. So I can't tell you how many times people send me a sales email or in-mail on LinkedIn and the subject line is about their software or something they're selling. It's nothing about me. So what I teach people is, is research that person. If you see that they went to a similar college or they went to the same college as you, put that in the subject line. I can't tell you how many times I've prospected somebody and my subject line is go Knowles. That's it. And so they open it and think, what on earth? What is this? And so then I go into the whole message and I say, hi, my name is Lindsay. I see you went to Florida State, great school. I majored in opera. It looks like you majored in communications. Uh, and then I talk about Guthrie's or something, some place that I ate. I haven't mentioned my software yet. It's unique. They're into it. They see that I research them. Then I go into the body of what my software offers or what I'm selling. And then I close it out with... Thanks for the consideration and appreciate the candor either way. 
I use the word candor a lot because it puts the fear out of a prospect saying no. I would rather them tell me no and put me on my misery immediately than string me along and wonder if they're going to ever say yes. So that's important. So research. Other things I've done, subject line wise. If you see on LinkedIn, there's an interest section on the bottom. If you see that they have a similar interest as you, so let's say it's CrossFit. That's one of my interests. If I see they're a CrossFitter in the subject line, I'll say, how did you finish on the Murph WOD? Only CrossFit people know what that is. He'll open it and say, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And then he'll write back to me. I swear, every time it works. Find some interest with them. If you can't see on LinkedIn what they're interested in, then look on Twitter, look elsewhere. Worst case is if you can't find anything that you have in common with them. So let's say you're a cat person, they're a dog person, you just can't lie about that. Then talk about where they work or talk about their tenure where they work. Talk about companies they've worked with in the past. These are all really, really great ways to open the door. I can't tell you how many times sending something random like that will help you get in the door. Other things I've done. So I've bought 10 Starbucks gift cards and physically cut them in half with scissors. And I mailed half of the gift card to a prospect and said, hi, Mr. Prospect, I will give you the other half of the gift card for 10 minutes of your time. You know what kind of response rate I got on that? I got 70%. 70% of people wrote me or messaged me back and agreed to that 10 minutes. Out of that, four of them moved forward. A lot of pipeline was built through that silly little exercise. So think outside the box. Other things I've done is I was prospecting Kohl's, the retailer, and this guy would not get back to me for nine months. And I kept working him and working him. He never said no. So I'm like, okay, there's still an opportunity here. And I ended up going to Kohl's and taking a picture of me checking out at Kohl's. And I sent it to him and I got a meeting. And then when I met him in person, he shook my hand very hard and said, you're the most persistent person I've ever met. And I said, thank you. And I got that meeting. We closed that deal. So crazy things. Persistence is key. Persistence is what makes me stand out than, more, than other people. I'm very persistent. I would rather get a no immediately. So until you've told me no, I will continue to work you. So researching, super, super important. Last thing I want to talk about researching is if you see that you have a mutual connection, first of all, see if the mutual connection is valid. I've got a lot of random people on my profile and in my network. So see how well the mutual connection is with you. If it's a good mutual connection, ask that person's permission to use their name. Do not blind, blindly send out, hey, James Copley referred me to you, and James is like, what? No, you didn't. So make sure they're okay with you using their name. If they are, subject line referred by X person, guaranteed open rate. Guaranteed. So look at your mutual connections. It's huge. That's another thing. If you leave here today with one other thing, mutual connections are big. So do that. Just make sure you get their permission. So last thing, I talk about a cadence when I teach classes across the, the nation. And one thing is when you're doing a cadence, everyone's cadence is different. So my cadence personally, it takes me eight touches to get a response. Eight. Teams that I've led, sometimes it takes them 19 touches to get a response. Just depends. But you have to develop a cadence. You have to be persistent with the cadence. And my cadence particularly is starting out on LinkedIn to do research and send them an in-mail. Then after the in-mail, I send them another in-mail through the sent folder. I remail it essentially. And then I send them an email and my email subject line is check your LinkedIn inbox. It has nothing to do with anything I'm selling. Check your LinkedIn inbox. And why do I do that? Because I want them to go to my LinkedIn profile because it's harder to say no to a person than a name. Another thing, when you're prospecting people, don't look at the name, look at the person. A lot of companies I work with, they cold call all day and all day and all day, and it's a boiler room, and they get to the person's name, and they just go through the motions of leaving a voicemail, sending a generic email, and going to the next one. They're looking at the name, not the person. So remember that. Okay, so this is my typical email and in-mail shell. This is very standard of what I send out. So you see the subject line is always personal. So it could be about a mutual interest, a mutual connection, college sports. I always use college sports. So I'm a Cowboys fan, unfortunately. And so if we recently lost or I see that we're both a Cowboys fan on Twitter, I will mention the game in my subject line always. I've gone to Roger Staubach's house. I used to live in Dallas. 
The people I worked with, remember the people at FedEx, the CEO of FedEx? People have a big network and they are friends with people like Roger Staubach and Emmett Smith. So when I go to their house, I talk about that in my subject line. It gets an open rate every time. The next part, again, opener, opener paragraph is always personal, always and forever personal. You talk about that mutual connection. You talk about that sport. Then the middle part is the value prop. What are, your, what are you selling? What do you do? Where do you work? Four to five sentences. And then the last part, thank you for the consideration and appreciate the candor. It's very easy. Candor is a great word. So that's my shell. And so tips for successful messaging. So again, if you leave with another thing today, it's be personal. Be personal always. Take the extra two or three minutes to research that person. It will go a very long way versus sending a batch and blast approach. Keep it short. So you know your smartphone? Think about the people you're prospecting. People I prospect are on the road always or they're in meetings a lot. So if your message is longer than a one swiper, so take your phone and move your thumb up once. If it's longer than a one swiper, it's too long. So consider that. Send yourself the note and see if it's too long. Always, always, always make it a one swiper. Be creative. I've shared a couple ways I've got people's attention. The Starbucks gift card. I've sent one shoe in the mail and said, I've got one foot in the door. Let me get the other one in. It worked. So do crazy things. Take pictures of yourself at the, at the place you're prospecting. Um, take pictures of yourself. When somebody goes dark on me, after about 12 touches, I will send a picture of me holding a frown face, like an upside down smiley face saying, did I offend you? Subject line, did I offend you, always gets open because they're like, oh my gosh, no, I'm just really busy. It works. And then be persistent and be professional. Okay, so who's viewed my profile? How many people go on here every day? Every day, often? Okay, so I go on here every day because I'm curious on who's been on my profile. And it's a really good way to prospect. I actually published an article this morning around nine o'clock about this specific feature. So how do you use the people that have been in your profile? How do you figure out if they're a good prospect or not? So that one way is obviously to see who's viewed your profile and then view theirs and see if there's some sort of commonality or interest for you to work with them or vice versa. But the key is don't message them that day. That's creepy. That's super creepy. And don't say something like, thanks for viewing my profile, because that's extra creepy. I would wait. Typically, what I tell people is I wait 24 to 48 hours. Typically, I do 48. Because then they kind of maybe forgot about me, and I don't want to be weird. So wait 48 hours. Also, when somebody views my profile, for me, that's affirmation. If I sent them a message, either on LinkedIn or email, it's affirmation that they read it. So I use it a lot that way as well. So consider looking at who's viewed your profile. And that opens me up for questions. So I'm sure there's questions in the audience. Anything goes. Um, my contact information will be loading shortly. And feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Feel free to follow me on Snapchat. I travel a lot, so my snaps are pretty amazing. And um, my Twitter handle is Lindsay Box. So questions for the audience. Uh, Troy. So the publication part, you mean? So publishing articles? Yeah, that's a great question. So I try to publish every other week or so. Some people publish weekly. It's a really good way because, first of all, when you publish an article, everyone in your network will get a notification on the top saying, Lindsay Boggs just published an article. So if it's about a sale, if it's about something that you're selling or some area that you're going to be in, something like that, publish it on LinkedIn, but don't just publish it with a link. You need to actually have content. So maybe a back history of why you're there, what you're selling, why it's important, why you should get on board with this, and then put a link to whatever you're doing. Um, but don't just do a one link. That doesn't look good. Other questions? Yes. It's still a one swiper. It's still a one swiper. It looks pretty lengthy on there, but it's actually still a one swiper. So um, if you want to cut something back, I would probably do three sentences on your value prop of what you're selling. Um, but 
I always make the first paragraph the biggest because it's the personalized part and they see that I research them. But yeah, it is deceptive, I agree, but it is a one swiper. Yep, yes. Mm. Yeah. Sure. So I wouldn't blindly send invitations to people because that will hurt your LinkedIn rapport. So they could block your account if you continually send um, messages to people that don't know you. So I'd be wary of that. Be cautious of that. But what you can do is research them on LinkedIn and then you can send them an email. Um, one tip I have here too, if people are having a hard time getting people's email addresses, there's a free Chrome extension called Email Hunter and it gets you email addresses. It's pretty accurate, pretty accurate, but it's free. Um, so sometimes I'll take the message offline to email and then I'll reference the fact that I saw their interests on LinkedIn or something like that. So that could help, but when you're sending a personalized invitation, I try to be the, per the most personal I can. So I don't talk about what I'm selling, I'm just very personal. Does that help? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yes, so the question was um, ways to build your personal brand but not conflict with what they're selling. So that's a great question and that's something that I do a lot is people know my brand and a lot of it is because what I write. So have you written any articles yet? Okay, so that's the first thing to do. Start publishing articles. You never know if the right person likes your article, you could go viral and then all of a sudden your brand is being built. Um, as far as conflicting with what you're selling, I think they go hand in hand. So I don't think that it's bad to have what you're selling on your profile and your summary as well. But you also wanna be looked at eventually as an expert in your field and then they'll call you a thought leader on the side. So, but writing is the first place to do it. Yep. Other questions? Yes. I would avoid that, like the plague. <laughs> yeah, and I see other, so the other thing I was gonna mention too, um, LinkedIn.com, so not Sales Navigator, LinkedIn.com, my feed is very busy. And I notice that if I refresh my page and I'm trying to find something that I just saw, it goes away forever. So one thing I wanted to point out is on LinkedIn.com, people are abusing it and they're posting math equations. And I'm very distracted by math equations because I'm not good in math. So every time the math equation comes up, I'm like, what is the answer? If you like that math equation or that, that picture that somebody posts that shouldn't be on LinkedIn, if you like it, then it's going to show up on other people's feed that you posted that. So don't do that. As much as you want to answer the math equation or as much as you want to you know, partake in this silly whatever it may be, don't do it. Does that answer your question? One thing I will say, one thing that's worked for me is when I travel, which is all the time, I will take a picture of the city and put it on my LinkedIn profile, my feed, and I'll say, I'm gonna be in Chicago next week. Who wants to connect? And that works really well. I did it a couple weeks ago and I got 10 appointments just from posting that. So if you travel a lot, consider doing that. You never know if the right person likes it or comments on it, it could go a little bit viral in the industry. I think we have one minute left. So last question, yes. Who's my initial contact? Well, it depends. So when I'm prospecting, I usually do three people at once. So I go by high, wide, and deep. So if the ultimate decision maker is the CMO, let's say, I will go after the CMO and the VP of e-commerce and VP of digital. But I don't send them the same message, obviously, because it's personalized. But I'll start prospect one on a Monday, and I'll start prospect number two on a Thursday, if that makes sense. So, OK, great. Well, I hope this was helpful. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to be here. We're doing a panel this afternoon as well. So if you have any questions, come find me. Thank you. Well, that was great. And of course, Lindsay Boggs, in terms of not